Hi everybody, welcome to another episode of our vlog. I'm Amit Zak, I'm a postdoc at the Center for Law and Economics here in Zurich. I have a great pleasure to talk today with uh, Professor Elena Yatza from uh, the Tepper Business School at Carnegie Law. And uh, we're very happy to have you here today and we're going to discuss your latest work about effort and selection effect of performance pay in knowledge creation. <laughs> So before we get started, uh, can you give us maybe a, a brief summary of the paper and the background? Absolutely. So in this paper, I look at the effort and selection effects of performance pay in knowledge creation. The reason I look at this is because we have a lot of evidence of positive effort and selection effects of performance pay in, in other contexts, in more routine tasks. So think of anything from fruit picking to tree planting, but we don't know whether performance pay has the same effect in the context of knowledge work. And knowledge work is a rather different beast. It deals with complex tasks, um, so there are many output dimensions, and the kind of incentives that are in place are often different, not just explicit incentives like bonuses, but also different kind of more implicit market-based incentives. And so it's an open question how that would affect effort and, and also selection or sorting patterns of academics. And so that's what I look at in the paper. Okay, that's great. So I'm curious about the story of the paper. So from what I know in empirical legal studies, uh, sometimes you, you write a paper starting from the data and you have a nice data set and you're exploring what can you learn from this data set. And in some cases, it's exactly the opposite. You have a specific hypothesis in mind, a, a topic you find interesting, and then you start searching for the data. So can you tell me a bit more about this specific paper and how did you end up writing about German academia? It's a, it's a great question. The answer is a little bit of both. Um, I was interested in, in understanding research networks and innovation networks. That's sort of how I came to be intrigued in, in the study of innovation and, and also in studying academia. And then I wanted to understand better how just the organization of innovation workers, of, of scholars, how that affects outputs. And I started to look at university systems in Europe, particularly because there is quite a bit of variation in how academia is structured within Europe. So it seemed a, a good context to look at this. And gradually I started to read up on what I might be able to do, what questions I might be able to ask. And through the papers that I was reading, I learned of one of the input data sets that I actually ended up using for this project, Kirchner's Deutsche Gelehrte Kalender. And it seemed that that could be a good building block to actually be able to collect a data set that would allow me to, to answer, to address various questions that have to do with the academic life cycle, with productivity, with how ideas are formed. And so then it all started to come together. It started with both the interest in, in how does this work? How does innovation come about? And where would I be able to collect and find the data to be able to address those questions? Okay, that's great. So let's move on to the next question and dig a bit more into your estimation strategy, right? Uh, so you use a different diff approach here and you, you look at the treatment and control based on different cohorts of uh, academics, so different uh, generations of academic, if you want. Uh, can you tell us a, a, a bit more about this unique estimation strategy and to what extent were you concerned about androgeneity issues and specifically reverse causality? I was concerned about all kinds of endogeneity, um, potential endogeneity, which is indeed why I use the identification structure that I use using a, a different diff comparing different cohorts um, and in particular comparing academics who, because of the start time of their first tenure affiliation, are paid according to the performance pay scheme versus academics who fall under an, an other much more flat wage pay scheme again because of when they started their first tenure affiliation that identification strategy allows me to abstract from or at least make sure that the results that i find are not driven by either emitted variable bias by 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 other 
uh, events that might be taking place at the same time or indeed reverse causality. So I noticed that you specifically observe the, the switcher groups, right? The people that move from a pay that is age-based to people that move for, uh, for performance-based. To what extent do they behave like the general group and what, what were you able to deduct from this specific group? That's a, it's another great question. So I have a, a slightly disappointing answer because the, the group of switchers is not quite large enough for me to be able to very precisely estimate what the effect of performance pay reform would be on these particular individuals. Also because, of course, here I have a concern with these particular switches actually selecting into the performance pay scheme. So I'm, I'm confounding selection and, and effort effects there for a bit. What I can say is I do robustness checks where I do the, I, I re-estimate my baseline model. So I just look at the productivity changes over time from before to after the, the reform of the treatment and control cohort. So the treated group is the cohort that falls on a performance pay scheme. Control are those academics who are paid according to the, the flat wage system. And I do this both with and without including the switchers. Now the switchers are of course academics who are part of the control group but then select into, opt into the performance pay scheme. And when I take these switches out of the control group, all of the results, all of the effort responses are stronger, which is what we would expect. Because of course, the switchers are the ones who opt into the performance pay scheme. So I treat them as control by way of how I assign people to the, the, control, um, the control cohort, but they're actually treated because they end up in the performance pay scheme. And so if anything, by including them in a control group, I get an underestimate of the true effort effect. When I take them out of the control group, the effort response is actually stronger. So that suggests that these switchers do indeed also respond positively to the performance incentives by increasing their effort. So I want to go back to the motivation of the paper. So if I read carefully, the motivation of the paper starts from the fact that um, different types of tasks could respond differently to incentives of, uh, of pay. Uh, so specifically, more complex tasks, like the, the task that we are talking about today, knowledge creation, could behave differently than tasks that are more uh, simple in their orientation. Um, but when you look at the results of your paper, you actually see that the people behave the same and that the, the fact that we're talking about a complex um, task doesn't interfere both in terms of magnitude and in terms of direction of the effect um, compared to regular tasks or ordinary tasks. So what can we infer from this? So again, that's, that's a great question. Um, and it's true that if we just look at the average effort effect in the quantity dimension, that both the sign and the magnitude is very much in line with other seminal papers by Lazier, Shearer, Bandira, and co-authors, which have been studied in much more in a setting where workers tend to much more routine tasks. Now, where my paper goes goes beyond this and and hopefully it adds new insights, is that I look at this other dimension that certainly in the context of knowledge work we care about a lot. So quality, the innovativeness of the work that's being produced, the impact that this work is. So simply put, not just quantity but a quality dimension as well. And here I find actually that on average, again, there is a, a decline in the average quality of the work that gets produced. And that's still not the entire story. Then I see and I look at the distribution of these effort responses by academics with a different productivity. And then there seems to be much more to the story, which we haven't seen in other papers yet, and certainly not for knowledge workers. And here, it seems to be very important. So for instance, the least productive academics, they respond very strongly in the quantity dimension, but they also just produce, as one would expect, the relatively least impactful papers, papers that do not garner a lot of citations or a lot of follow-on research and which is not very innovative. On the other end of the distribution, the really highly productive academics, they do produce more papers as well. Those papers are of higher quality, these are the very productive academics, but they do not produce more of the highest quality papers, the truly innovative seminal papers. And then in the middle, 
there is actually very clear crowding out of quality where we actually see that that some of the intermediate or the medium productivity academics they now produce fewer of the most impactful of the highest quality papers and they don't necessarily even step up that much in terms of the quantity so there is a clear crowding out and so really unpacking this response in terms of not just the dimension of the response, quantity and quality, but also in terms of the distribution, um, the, the variation that exists in this response by different productivity classes, I think that is the core contribution of this paper. Usually in a law and economics conference, in the end you will get this question, what are the normative implications of, of your results? Or um, being more specifically, what do you think policy makers can learn from this? So I think this is indeed the, the core of the policy implication. This, this particular performance pay reform that I look at was mandated to be budget neutral. So it didn't cost the, the, the federal and, and the state, and in particular the, the state's Ministry of Education, more to more highly incentivize professors. And what we get is more research. We get more papers. We just do not get more of the highest quality, the most impactful, the most innovative papers. So on the one hand, we get more research output without paying more. Now, the tricky bit is presumably the extra effort that academics now spend, expend on, on writing papers is, is effort, is time that they're not spending on other pursuits and other activities. It could be leisure activities, but it could also be advising scholars, advising students. So even though this may not have had a, a direct cost for the state's Ministry of Education, there is a cost, there's an effort or time cost. I do not have the data to, to be able to estimate or assess that cost, but that's something we should be wary about. And depending on where that effort, where that time that's now spent writing some, some additional papers, where that time, that effort is coming from, the cost might be bigger than the benefit, especially because we are not getting more of the most impactful papers. And so that's something that should be taken into account and why I think, I hope, policymakers will look closely and, and think carefully before introducing these kind of incentive systems in the context of, of knowledge work. Because even though I cannot estimate the cost, there has to be a cost and it's it's not clear whether that cost is, is smaller than the benefit. Okay, so that concludes our session for today. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Yatsma, for joining us uh, here today. And we're looking forward to your uh, future work on the topic uh, and future visits, per, uh, perhaps, uh, for our vlog viewers. So thank you uh, for joining us. I hope you enjoyed uh, the discussion as much in, as, as I did. And we hope to see you again.